All right. Good day, everybody. Welcome to another edition of Spectrum Cast, specifically around data modernization. Uh, I am very fortunate to be joined by a host of folks here today. Of course, we have Randy, the co-host. Sean is here with us today. Trisha couldn't make it with us. Uh, we also have uh, Venkat Crowley and Greg Van Hise, both from the data protection side of the house. Greg on the on the IBM side, Venkat on the on the Red Hat side. And what we wanted to talk about was elaborate a little bit more on the podcast we did a while ago around containers and um, and the protection of containers. So with that, let's let's get let's get a good overview here and start. Maybe Randy, you can talk about. This whole notion of containers has really started to hit the streets and that sort of thing. Why containers? Why, why are folks moving to containers? Yeah, that seems to be a, uh, a popular question these days. I mean, I think the, the short answer is that containers are really the next logical evolution or the current logical evolutionary step in the delivery of, of IT services, right? So if you think about you know, back in the olden days, monolithic kind of single computer sitting in a room somewhere with an army of people you know, programming them and some supporting them, whether it's early mainframes, and then we moved into client server network distributed workloads, then the next wave was kind of virtualization as a way to uh, make more efficient use and more effective use of resources and capital. And sort of we've logically now migrated to containers because it's a way to just continue that same trajectory or that same arc towards really maximizing the utilization of resources and also you know, standardizing and abstracting um, different physical resources and capabilities into logical services that can be consumed, you know, in a much more granular and much more fractional way. So it's just a more efficient way uh, to deliver services. And, and it also provides a perfect fr framework for um, flexibility and openness. So um, I actually, the previous call I was on was a big uh, global blueprint discussion around the importance of storage for containers and specifically Red Hat uh, OpenShift, obviously, but for containers in general. Um, you know, containers originally existed as kind of a, a programming metaphor or design pattern that relied on sort of ephemeral data. They were kind of stateless and the idea is you'd spin them up and down, you know, granularly and on demand in a very elastic way as, as required. But of course, as soon as those workloads started to migrate into the enterprise, the need for persistent storage and state, you know, maintaining state and protecting the data and, and having the traditional or what you would consider to be more uh, traditional data services became obviously super important. So we've now evolved to the point where we've got, you know, very robust, you know, enterprise hardened data services for containers, just like we do for bare metal, client server, virtualization, et cetera. And, and you know, the forefront of that is, is OpenShift container storage um, and, and our partnership and obviously close alliance working with the Red Hat data services team, we've been able to deliver a really um, capable set of data services to support these container environments. And, and the last thing I'll say is that it, it's also a great vehicle um, when used with our cloud packs, which are our new kind of go-to-market vehicle uh, for our software assets. It's a way for clients to use um, the data management layer to really enable and provide a lot of um, very advanced capabilities for all cloud packs. So regardless of whether they're doing integration um, you know, data lake modernization, application modernization and refactoring and, uh, you know, big data and analytics, streaming, you know, pick your workload, pick your environment. We now have a solution that supports all of them and does so in a very, uh, very seamless and very, very powerful way. So long answer to a short question. No, no, no very, very good. And, <laughs> and as you kind of alluded to, right, um, over the course of time, and I've read, in, uh, been reading a lot in, in, the, in, the, in the trade press about, uh, okay, now we have containers and the thought process around containers is really about ephemeral, uh, spin them up, spin them down, utilize them. But, but over time, we've migrated to this notion around containers need actually persistent storage. And we have, mm -hmm. then we came into all these, these concepts and terms around container ready storage, container native storage, um, as you called out, right, OCS with container ready storage. Venkat, I don't know if you can kind of help us get a perspective of the storage aspects around around containers these days? Sure, Steve. Uh, so as you and Randy has alluded to, right, as containers are evolving, uh, the type of applications that are being deployed in containers are also evolving, right? So containers are being looked at as a development platform 
for many of the business critical applications, right? Uh, both existing applications and also cloud native applications. And many of them do require a state, right? As you were alluding to earlier. So we do, the current storage systems uh, are evolving to meet those needs uh, for container applications. Um, one thing that uh, we realized is that, uh, you know, when you look into the containers and the way they use the persistent storage, even with the ephemeral nature of the containers, right? The containers are meant, are built uh, for being infrastructure agnostic, right? Which means they're not uh, meant to be tied to any particular, um, you know, infrastructure, uh, right? Uh, even with that, so they pro they came up with uh, certain constructs on how you can use a persistent storage while not sacrificing the, uh, you know, the the mobility of of these containers. Uh, so, uh, so the, these are the, the new interfaces that have evolved uh, uh, called container storage interfaces. These are standardized interfaces on how the storage should be provisioned uh, for these container applications. So in response to that, we have built a solution uh, for taking our existing uh, storage system, uh, um, a, which is a distributed storage system, very popular in the open source community called Ceph and made that to work for container applications. And in doing so, uh, you know, there are a lot of automation that we built, right? Uh, where the developers or the, devel the, the DevOps uh, personnel who are gonna be consuming the storage doesn't need to be bogged down by all the uh, intricacies and all the knowledge of managing a storage system. So it is basically freeing them up from managing that storage system uh, with using using a set of storage operators. So the storage operators, again, as a, an operator in a container world, is essentially an automated uh, way to manage something to bring it to a particular desired state, right? So using a lot of this automation, uh, the OpenShift container storage is essentially providing you a way to easily consume uh, the uh, the storage without having to take the burden of uh, administering and managing it, right? So that's essentially what the OpenShift container storage is in a nutshell. You know, taking an existing uh, uh, you know distributed storage system like SAF and turning that into a con uh, container consumable uh, persistent storage system. Uh, then again, I, I want to just ask a question about maybe what, and maybe ask the team what we see going on now. Uh, the way we talk about containers is very dish different from traditional application development, right? But that being said, there's this whole array of traditional applications that are kind of out there and in use in the world today. Do, do we see, you know, with regard to applications on the container side, is it mostly new development or is it people who are taking existing applications and porting them to containers or is it a combination of the two? That's a good saying? question, Sean. Uh, right. So, uh, right. As with many things, uh, it's both. Uh, Right, which is that, so there's obviously a, a desire to take the existing applications and these applications are not going away. They have been serving, you know, critical business functions for, for a long time. And to bring them to the modern architecture, right? Uh, there are a few ways that you could do that, right? So one is that, you know, essentially let's understand what the container architecture is and how it is different from the traditional architecture. Containers in a nutshell as, uh, you know, uh, Randy is alluding to earlier, right? It's essentially a microservices, which is you're basically developing your application in small bytes, right? In small components and in a very modular uh, way so that you could each test this, you know, each component separately. And so you can, you can speed up your development, right? Uh, in doing so. So essentially microservices is the core underpinning of the container architecture. Right, so when you move this uh, application that you built in a more monolithic, uh, you know, in a traditional way and moving to this modular containerized uh, architecture, right, you either can do this uh, by completely refactoring it, which is essentially mean you're almost redeveloping it, right, re-architecting it and, uh, you know, doing it from scratch, which is obviously very, uh, uh, you know, that's very exactly expensive what I don't and, want to uh, do, right? Stuff. At least not all at once. Exactly, right? Well, that's what, that gives you the most benefits of the container modularization, but at the same time, yes, it's not all feasible, 
example, uh, for moving all these applications, it is very, very expensive. And there's also ways you can gain some of the benefits of the containers by something called lift and shift, right? So you basically take uh, your most monolithic application and you actually build it around a container. Yes, one could argue that you do not get all the benefits of the uh, container, but you still are participating in that, uh, in that ecosystem, right? And there are still benefits that you will get from a container management system uh, you know, uh, through that. So you see uh, these things happening in both ways, right? Uh, some of the applications that can be refactored are being refactored. But I would say that at this point, uh, we see many of the customers essentially you know, taking their existing applications and, uh, you know, and building onto a container and running it on a container management system. Yeah, maybe Ben, Kat, I just kind of maybe pile on a bit, but you know, even our Spectrum Protect Plus server, right? We, we just containerized that and moved it over. And I'll say it was a bit of a, a hybrid approach, right? It wasn't like a single monolithic container that we took, right? And moved it into the, the Kubernetes OpenShift environment, but we did start to break it down a bit, right? You know, we have a, a MongoDB database different from a Virgo server. And, you know, so we started breaking it down somewhat, but that's just the beginning of the journey, right? And we'll be refactoring that and creating a number of, you know, additional services follow on to that. But so I, I agree with Venkat, right? It kind of depends. And I think when, if you look a couple of years from now, right, you're going to be seeing a whole lot of cloud native applications that are refactored, right? When you start getting, you know, pick it a couple of years from now, right? It'll, that pencil well, will be. I, you know, and I think that gets back to the, the importance of, uh, of integration as a kind of skill set or a discipline that, that plays very heavily in containerization, right? Because you've got the segmentation of, of traditional workloads and applications into microservices and smaller, you know, more atomic units, that creates obviously a massive inventory of services and kind of things that you've got to keep track of and then assemble into functional units of some kind or functional services. Um, so it, it, it does create a lot of important integration requirements. The flip side of that, though, is that the, the services and the infrastructure data services are emerging to make that a lot easier, right? So if you had to do, you know, what you're talking about, refactoring the SPP, you know, server into a container environment, you know, even two or three years ago, that would have probably been a considerably more complicated initiative than it is now. So I think that there's a lot of enabling technologies and a lot of instrumentation that's becoming available and tooling that's becoming available to make that a lot easier. So just a, it's, it's a great point. Just a comment, right? I would say Kubernetes itself has done a lot of enablement, right? Whether mm -hmm. it's, you know, we don't want to get into whatever stateful sets, right? CSI interfaces, snapshotting now is, you know, so I think in 2021, all the foundational pieces, you know, that Kubernetes had put, you know, needs that we need to protect data, those are there now, right? And we'll, we'll be having GA support for CSI snapshotting, you know, and, and also, yeah, the, the pieces are getting there to where you can really do this now. The point that you bring up, Greg, uh, if I may just may add, right, uh, Greg brings up a good point, which is that a lot of the uh, uh, aspects of IT management, you know, that has been well developed and well understood in the traditional and in virtualized environments that have gone, you know, that have been developed over the past decades, right? The container uh, ecosystem, as it's evolving, right, has to rediscover or, or you know, or, or, or manage these uh, these constructs, has to develop these constructs, right? Uh, just Greg just brought up like snapshots, right? So you know, we understood snapshots when it's very well adopted, uh, in you know, for backups and you know, test dev environments uh, for for a, for a long while, right? Uh, the snapshots are just being implemented in the container management system, right? So it, it, essentially, you know, the containers are having to go uh, and reinvent. Uh, so maybe reinvent is not the right word, but essentially how to go, you know, rediscover all these uh, capabilities that, that we are taking for granted in the traditional environments. And that is happening right now uh, because the need exists. Um, but it's a journey that, that's, uh, that's happening. I was just going to say, I think as the need exists, it's very important, right? I mean, we're getting to a point now where we're just starting to see adoption and we're reaching scale. And the more these applications you have and you're running in a container-based environment, the more you need that type of, of process on top of it, right? Mm -hmm. 
So Greg, we're going to now put you on the hot seat, right? We, uh, our, our podcast is all around modern data protection, right? We've talked about containers. We've got down to the storage. This, these new applications are creating, you know, data, right? And data needs to be protected, whether we like it or not. All these, uh, we, we've started to discuss and talk about these storage management capabilities, whether it be snapshotting and that sort of thing, but obviously data protection being one of the key things. So IBM has released uh, capabilities for protecting containers. We did that a while ago. Tell us a little bit about some of the, the design principles that we had from the very beginning and then kind of as we've evolved this through the course of last year, and then maybe a little bit about what we're thinking about and where we're going. Sure. Um, so I would say kind of from the design principles or, or what we started with, it, I, to me, it starts with who are the users and what needs to be protected, right? <laughs> we we kind of got to think through both those things. And maybe if I started with the, the what needs to be protected, right? We have this stateful data. You could think about a MongoDB database, right? And it's, it's volumes, you know, persistent volumes. So being able to snapshot those persistent volumes, leveraging CSI snapshot technology, right, is one of those foundational of what we need to protect and how we're protecting it with the, the CSI snapshotting. And then we also, you know, two classes of resources, the persistent volumes and then the etcd metadata. There's a key value store in the Kubernetes OpenShift world, right, that has a lot of the operational characteristics of the environment. A lot of the application configuration kind of information is there. So we need to, we need to capture that as well, right? So we wanted to standardize for that part of the problem on leveraging um, Bolero and the OpenShift APIs for data protection, right? So we, you know, Venkat and I, gosh, we've been meeting a lot on this, right? Over this last year or whatever, getting getting lined up on that. So I, I think to me, the, those are kind of the two keys of what we need to protect. And then when we talk about who are we providing this solution for, um, you got to develop a solution that's relevant to the new stakeholders, right? Those, those new stakeholders are the the app developers, right? The the Kubernetes administrators, OpenShift administrators, right? We gotta we gotta really be thinking about those. And then I'll say while while still keeping in mind, we have central IT, right? That their objective is basically to manage the protection of this heterogeneous set of workloads, of which you know OpenShift is one of those. But they want to be able to have consistent management across the board, right? So. Um, we need to we need to keep that in mind while focusing on app developers. I would say, you know, from their perspective, I think Randy talked about look, self service key, right? The whole, you know, just like you can do self service access to storage, you want to be able to have self service access to data protection services, right? And you want to be able to operate in interfaces that are familiar with that application developer, and and being able to have custom resources, being able to um, integrate with the cube CTL, the CLI interface for how that application developer works is key, right? So we, we really needed to think about that application developer, what they needed and, and bring capabilities to them. Um, and then also I'd say from that, that DevOps, the ops side of that, you know, thinking about the, the operations person, the Kubernetes administrator, the OpenShift administrator, um, you, you need to be able to deploy a management solution in a way that makes sense to them, right? So you can think about operators, containers, right? Being able to deploy your management solution into those environments, um, we thought was key. And then being able to um, allow them to have use cases, like you know, so the app developer wants to protect uh, maybe a namespace, their, their specific application. The OpenShift admin might want to protect the cluster, right? You know, being able to protect that entire cluster and being able to support those kind of use cases for them, right? So. I think it's kind of a combination of those kind of technology components and using those to cater to the right right set of users, right? Is um, you know what we what we were targeting um, with with what we're doing. And um, so, Greg, I, I like where you, where you started to talk about, and and you really focused on the user perspective from our design principles perspective. One of the things I like to think we do a pretty good job at with the Spectrum Cast is a real focus on. If I'm a user in IT, how do I take this knowledge that we're kind of bequeathing amongst people and say, how do I use that, right? And one of the things is if, if I'm in IT, what are the types of things I should be listening for to kind of understand or know, do I need a protection solution around containers? Um, What's coming? What are the types of questions I should be asking to be prepared for this? And and it doesn't have to be just you, Greg, to, that, that answer is uh, anybody in the group. Again, if you're thinking about 
you talk uh, an IT professional, I'm trying to trying to make sure I'm protecting the data that's being created from these new applications. Development is off running around building these things. How am I sure I'm protecting the business in a proper way? It's, I'll, I'll start kind of real quick. Yeah, I think you you have to be tuned in first to those users, right? Because I'll I'll play it back, right? The anyway, kind of the example, right? The VMware movie ten years ago, right? I, I think I could envision a lot of cases where I'll say the central IT group didn't know necessarily what the the VMware team was off there doing, right? And and they're solving their protection problems, right? So so you need to be I think one, just starting with basic communication and understanding what's going on in your organization and being able to, you know, think about, you know, are you putting these, are you have these new workloads running in production? Do they have stateful data, you know, that I should be supporting? Because I think there's a lot that central IT can bring to the table that potentially those app developer roles aren't necessarily thinking about governance, SLAs, you know, how do I really manage this stuff efficiently? So, to me, it's, it's part of it. It's a two-way communication process, right? Being aware of what's there and educating those groups as well, right? On, on what you can bring to the table and make their, their life better. Yeah, that's right, Greg. Uh, so I think if you look into the early days of containers, right? So as I was mentioning earlier, one of the origins for containers is to provide that freedom or agility for the developers to be free from infrastructure and you know do their development um, without being constrained by the infrastructure and without being you know uh, being bounded by what their IT providers are, are providing uh, to that right and sometimes that freedom you know uh, you know in in less mature environments and looks looks great uh, but you will soon run into the, all the issues that uh, Greg pointed out, right? So there are things that you need to worry about, the data governance and regulation and, and all the other aspects, right? You know, which is hard to do on each application basis, right? So you need to have an infrastructure evolving to meet those, meet those uh, needs. Mm -hmm. So what we are finding now is that, you know, that pendulum that, you know, when it's, you know, when it's swung towards, towards uh, having a full free and I will dictate what my application needs and how, I'll, you know, how my application behave, we'll run into the constraints that you have, right, in terms of what the infrastructure can support. Now we're actually seeing, you know, many of these applications, in fact, do not want that uh, burden of uh, you know you know creating the policies and you know building all the you know the core uh, uh, issues that really belongs that can be better scaled and better managed at the infrastructure level, right? So you know they are okay with operating within a certain guardrails, uh, right? Uh, in in terms of having their applications that developed. So we actually now see as the containers get to more and more enterprises and more mature environments. Uh, you know, we see uh, the infrastructure evolving and still providing that agility for the developer, but, you know, within a certain set of guardrails uh, yeah, that, are, so, that are provided. So that, and that's kind of the trick, right? And, and if you think about the evolutionary process, it's the same process. So again, we go back to the early days of enterprise computing all the way up to and including containers there's inevitably this groundswell of developer interest and, you know, they're all experimenting and doing these interesting skunk works things. And uh, somebody gets wind of it and decides this is great. We want to scale it up. We want to run it in the enterprise. You then encounter a whole new set of challenges or, or requirements around security, data protection, privacy, and, and the number of those requirements is only increasing. It's not decreasing. Right? So you have this, constant struggle between innovation of the developers and scaling out rapidly and effectively and ag agilely to the enterprise. The good thing that I think containers provide and Kubernetes and OpenShift provides is the, uh, the tooling to, to make that transition possible is much cleaner, I guess, if I had to pick a word for it. It makes that process a lot faster and a lot more painless the developers don't have to be as concerned about specifics around compliance and security and sovereignty, et cetera. They can be creative and be innovative. Then the environment itself is, is instrumented in such a way that it, it makes that transition to the enterprise a lot easier, which is great. That's another reason why containerization is, you know, growing so quickly. I was also I mean, saying, I mean, 
as these things mature, usually what happens is they, they grow to take the best of both worlds, right? They try to take the innovation and the creativity of the, the new technology, whatever it might be, and kind of merge them in with, with some of the best practices and known, known, uh, known ways of doing things that come from the enterprise to produce something. And that's, that's what's always happened and that's what's gonna happen with it. Yeah, you could almost argue that the whole DevOps you know, movement or the whole DevOps phenomenon essentially mandated the existence of something like Kubernetes because it wouldn't work otherwise. The whole CI CD model, the whole DevOps model really requires that kind of a workflow. So I guess it's good that they evolved at the same time or maybe it was a cause and effect. No more open help desk tickets, right? To get <laughs> to get storage or backup services, right? You wanna have that on demand, right? And well, I mean, I, I, think, I think that's that's a really good point, right? If I look at it from, from, you know, people always say data protection doesn't make my business money, right? It's an insurance policy. You have to have it, right? Because if you don't have it, you're in a lot of trouble. But if I can look at one place I want to try to save, it's in all my data management solutions because it's the, it's the applications, it's the people creating the applications that are actually driving the business forward, making me more competitive. So as a developer, the other side of the fence um, we've talked a lot about what, what IT should be thinking about and, and how they should be listening with well, the things they should be listening for. As a developer, I'm starting to have to think about compliance for the business, security of the business, uh, protection of the business. What types of things should I as a developer be thinking about that I might not have thought about before when thinking about how to ensure I'm picking a decent solution to make sure my, my environment's protected? I would flip that around and, and, and sort of turn that on its head and say, uh, I, developers now, I think, as I was kind of saying or alluding to before, can consume predefined services or predefined kind of open source or commercial solutions or product sets that have a lot of that engineered in. So they don't have to really think about it as much. It's almost like you're flipping it around. They used to have to be domain experts in protection and movement and replication and sovereignty and security and compliance. Now I think they, they don't have to be. I think they're much less reliant on that domain expertise and that frees them up to just think about logic and service and flow and efficiency and, and competitive positioning or competitive advantage, which I think again is another collateral benefit of this whole DevOps containerization movement. And I think then if we go back to, to Greg's initial positioning about IBM's design principles around some of this stuff, we really thought about the who, right? We thought about IT and the ops side of the business. And we also thought about the development side of the business, Greg, I don't know, or Venkat, I mean, I know you've seen the solutions. I don't know if you guys want to elaborate a little bit on that. No, yeah, uh, absolutely. So, I mean, if you look into the solutions uh, that are that are coming up, right? And, and as Randy was alluding to as well, right? So the, the developers, you know, right, it's actually a lot more advantages for them to kind of select a set of uh, solutions that will free them from having to worry about a lot of this uh, core core needs, right? Uh, and uh, they'll be happy to, and they'll be faster in developing and building their logic, uh, right? Uh, and and doing, the, doing the development, you know, within the, the, whatever the, uh, you know, the, the guardrails that are provided by that, uh, by that, this core set of, uh, uh, core set of uh, infrastructure, infrastructure products, right? So, I mean, you see the storage uh, products that are coming along to, to provide that, right? Where you actually can, you know, consume just the storage without having to go bother with managing that storage itself. Right. The same thing with the data protection, right? As uh, you know, Greg were alluding to, right? You can just basically figure out how to use the set of policies that are created already and use those policies to, to back up rather than having to go worry about how you do, you know, back managing the backup targets and where does it back up to and 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 uh, all this other administration that uh, come, come, comes along with it. Right. Um, one thing that needs to be clear in is that sometimes it is projected as that, oh, you know. To run containers, I need to just throw off all my old infrastructure and uh, how to go, you know, build it, uh, you know, from scratch because the old one does not, uh, uh, you know, does not work for containers. You know, that's not entirely true, right? And you know, these infrastructures which have been evolved for many years and decades, right, can be, uh, you know, 
evolved and morphed into managing containers as well. And that's what we are seeing with the Spectrum Protect, how Spectrum Protect is evolving, right? And, you know, managing containers as effectively as, as it did with the virtual, virtual environments and traditional environments. And in fact, when you do a protect, right, you're just, you can't just protect just a container and leave the rest of the um, other components alone, right? You need to protect the, the entire, uh, you know, uh, environment for your application to, to come back up. So you do need to have solutions that will work for both traditional and container environments, right? And there are tools that are coming up to, to, to in providing that. Yeah, I think that the app developer, to me, they're, they're the ones that they, they, they want the service available <laughs> that, that they can subscribe to or use, right? And maybe when you're talking about picking a solution from a data protection, I was going to say it's more that operations side of the house that really needs to select that solution, right, that can make it easy for that, that application developer to, to consume it, right, or whatever. So, you know, and in some cases, those might be the, the same folks, you know, they might be separate, you know, those, those kind of worlds are coming, but it's kind of that op side of things, I think, typically that's involved in that data protection, you know, ma the, the management side of the problem, right, you know, whether it's, you know, data protection is one of those disciplines. There's also... Yeah, so just a quick comment to build on that. The, the other, I think, and Steve, you said this earlier, uh, data protection is not sexy. It's not viewed as a competitive advantage, but if it enables additional services or capabilities like data reuse, like better data management, like data repurposing or you know whatever the case may be, extracting more, more value from that data using it the protected form, then that does potentially have a, a, a competitive or a, an operational or a financial benefit. So I think that there are, you know, that has to be taken into consideration as well. I agree with you, Randy. Anything I can get more out, more of out of one tool uh, versus having to spend on multiple tools definitely allows me to take some of that savings and put it towards some of those, those uh, other competitive advantage kind of, kind of capabilities. So Team, I want to thank you guys all uh, very, very much. I think this is a great, uh, this was a great, uh, let's say, next step or phase two from our from our original podcast around around containers. And I look forward to the discussion and going further. Uh, Greg and Venkat, I really appreciate your knowledge and your expertise and bringing that to the table here. Uh, Randy, thanks for for a lot of the info. And Sean, again, thanks for uh, for the insightfulness around kind of some of the things that people think about when it comes to protecting information. I really appreciate it. Um, I want to thank all you guys and uh, we'll see you soon.